Welcome to this conversation with Michael Deneen. What an amazing story. I'm sure that this is going to touch your hearts too. Hi, Michael Deneen, author of Suburban Gangster. <laughs> How you doing today? I'm good. Oh my goodness. I got to tell you, reading your book, I was just like, <laughs> the whole time it was just so far outside of any world that I've ever been exposed to like you know besides movies or tv shows or whatever <laughs> right most people I've gotten basically the same reaction from just about everybody who's read the book they walked away like shaking their head like whoa whoa what really struck me about it was a lot of things but especially just how unapologetically honest you were about your feelings and about what what you went through and how did it feel to go back and just remember all of those feelings and all of those it it was tough i mean some of the stuff was tough when i was writing and i was i was looking at myself like because some of the things when i was going through them i didn't think about them as it was happening but when you step back and you all of a sudden look at it with a little clarity and you're like whoa you know, God, I can't believe I was doing that. Yeah. Um, so what what made you decide to write this book? Um, here we go. Uh, okay. I we had we had an incredibly active and wild business going for about probably 10, 15 years, okay, uh, in the drug business and stuff. And the stuff that was going on, like, it was unbelievable. The people that, you know, were around us and stuff, you know, couldn't believe the stories, the things that were happening from day to day. In the 1990s, the early 90s, one of my friends says to me, he goes, you know, you want to write a book about this stuff. And I said, maybe one day, we'll see. You know, and it was actually, it stuck in my mind after he said it. And every so often, I would go back and think about it. But at that point, the story wouldn't have been complete in the early 90s because it goes on for quite a ways after that. And then uh, then I had enough to, to do with it. I moved back from Brooklyn in 2010 and uh, I was just hanging around Huntington for a year or two. And then I said, you know what? Now is the time I have to tell this story. Mm. Yeah, honestly. I was, I, one of the things that kept me just like, I couldn't put it down was just waiting for you to realize how bad it was because in your remembering the past voice, there wasn't like any sense of guilt or whatever. It was just like, yeah, I, I should have killed that guy. And, and I didn't regret anything. And I was making so much money and living such a decadent life. And it was just like, but when is he going to realize that it wasn't good? <laughs> Listen, that's the thing, like, I actually did, but that was my feelings at the time when I mentioned yeah. about that one guy. I was trying to express my feelings at the time. Yeah, I totally get that now. You know, and, uh, but I do at the end, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm somewhat apologetic and I'm trying to make a point at the end that this is no life for anybody. And if you choose that road to go down, you're going to forget about it. There are no winners. It's a game nobody ever wins. And it's not even a game. Did you like cut every single person out of your life from when you were getting clean? Uh, I did. I kind of did. Uh, when I got finally got everything out of my system, I, I wasn't really told. I was not talking to too many people anymore. I talked to a couple of people that were around back then, but I don't have too much involvement with too many people anymore. I try and keep it... Uh, Try to keep things low key. I can't get in any trouble anymore. I'm too old now. Yeah. Oh man, it's just extraordinary what you've lived through and what you've seen. It, does it ever feel like did that really happen to me? Was that because I feel this way about like my life before when I was a traveling actor missionary? I feel like did I really do all those things? Did I really perform in different languages in different countries? It feels so different from who I am now. You know, when you're caught up in, in while you're living it, Kate, you don't have time. Like, there was so much going on at that time. We didn't have any time to stop and think about consequences or this, that, the other. Well, you just, and in that life, it, 
all those crazy things that were going on is so commonplace that it becomes like not like a big deal. Somebody died yesterday. Oh, really? Step over the body, keep moving, you know, and it was just brutal. The lifestyle is people glamorize it and stuff in these movies and stuff. And I'll be honest with you, there's nothing to glamorize about it on the day to day uh, things and dealings that you're doing from day to day because you have to be extremely brutal with people. And it's tough because everybody tries to stab you in the back and stuff. And it's a very, very harsh environment. Mm. But I mean, when now looking back, does it feel like, did that really happen to me? Was that somebody else? It is. When I, when I finally finished the book, I was like, I sat down and I reread it a couple of times. And I, one night I was just sitting there and I'm like, well, how stupid was I? The stupidity on all of us. Like, we put ourselves in that predicament, believe it or not. We, we were, you know, we were getting high when we were in junior high school and high school and stuff, right? And around ninth grade, I started not really paying attention to school anymore. And I was actually an honor roll student at one time. But uh, so I was hanging out with these idiots and, you know, they didn't care about it either. Nobody cared about the future. No one worried about that. And what happened is, is by the time we got out of high school, I actually had gotten kicked out of school. I never even graduated. Most of my friends, we put ourselves in a position to where we had very limited options because we had no education. And it kind of that, those decisions, what drove us onto that path of getting involved in the illegal drug trade because everybody wanted to get rich. You saw everybody making money, you wanted to get rich. And that was the easiest way to do it at that time. But we never thought about the consequences before getting involved, which was a really dumb thing. Hmm. But I was, it was really heart-wrenching to read about when you got caught up in heroin. And I just, it just breaks my heart to think about how judged addicts are. And people like say, well, just make it illegal. Don't give them anything. And it's like, it doesn't work like that. You have to have compassion for people that are, their bodies are dependent on it. It's, it is so hard. I, it was the most difficult time I, when I was addicted to heroin. People do not understand how brutal and painful that addiction is. When you're high, it's all great and everything, right? But then half the time you're stuck in withdrawal. You know, because after it runs out, you got to go start chasing it and try and getting it and hoping you have enough money, you know, and, and after a while, you know, you, you're living from day to day and from fix to fix. And it is just a punishing existence. Oh. It is. And you have to have compassion because I, these people are sick. I was very sick at that one time. I mean, I was I, I, I was not myself anymore. I was turning into a monster and uh, the addiction had brought me to a low that I had never thought I would go to. Yeah. But I was able to, in the end, thank God, I had some supportive people around me, my girlfriend, Christine, and uh, my mother, Eileen, who passed away last year. Uh, they were so pivotal in my recovery. That's so That's wonderful that you had such loving people in your life. I'm sorry about your, mo your mom. Thank you. You know, what I want to do is uh, my mother, uh, you know, we had a talk before she passed after the stroke. And uh, I, me and her have been talking for a long time. And I, I told her, I said, I want to take the, my experiences. I want to turn this into a TV series and then use that and set up a foundation and try and help people, mm -hmm. you know, help people that are addicts, people that are struggling, uh, family problems and stuff like that. Anybody who's struggling in life and try and do something to help them. Because I, I need to turn this negative from years ago into the ultimate positive. Yes. Everything can be redeemed. Everything can be used to just turn it back around and say to other people, you're not alone. It must, and to teach, especially teach the families and friends of addicts what they can do and how best to love and support someone through, through that horrible withdrawal process. It was my mother's love that had me hang in there because there were so many times where I'm telling you, I was really close to pulling the plug on myself. 
I mean, really close. And it had been for her, I would not be here today. Wow. That support was so big. Mm, makes me like get feel kind of choked up. Just I can I can feel what you're saying. It's just, it's so powerful. She picked me up one day. I was in a hotel, and uh, I had run out of drugs, and I was so sick, right? Physically so sick from it. And she walked in the hotel room. I was sitting there. I had probably lost 20, 30 pounds, and I, my arms are bruised and bloody, and the scabs and everything everywhere. And she looked at me and I told her, I said, mom, I told her on the phone. I said, this is it. I said, I have to go try and do this. And uh, she came in the room. And when I saw the look on her face, the shock, like she could not believe how bad I looked. And she just tried to, you know, like hold it in and not cry. And I never wanted to see her like that again. It broke my heart. And so Christine came into your life when you were sort of coming up out of all of this, right? Yeah, she actually was the one that brought me over the top in the end. Uh, when I moved up to Brooklyn, I was still dabbling a little bit. But uh, when I met her, I stopped. I was still on the methadone program, but I had stopped everything. I, I didn't do heroin after that. I wasn't doing anything. And because she one night... When I first started dating her, she came in and I uh, I threw down some cocaine on the table and she she looked at me like, what? She's like, are you out of your mind? She put a coat on and said, see ya. And she took off. I didn't hear from her for like two, three weeks. And I got the message right there. She's like, I am not dealing with that. If you ever, ever do that again, bye bye. What an amazing woman. Yeah, she was there. And, you know, when I was living in Brooklyn, things were really, really tough. I had like next to no money and it was a real, real struggle. You know, I had I had so many things going on when I was living in there. I had a run in with the police and uh, the police, about five or six cops beat the living daylights out of me on the sidewalk one day and they almost killed me. And uh, so I had to be careful. After that, they threatened me every time they saw me. They shook me down probably three, four times a week when they saw me walking through the neighborhood. It was really, really scary time. It just seems like it's a night and day. I don't, I mean, I've always lived in a bubble, so I don't really know the realities of the world. I remember when I dated this guy and he was like, oh yeah, there's a crack house oh, right over there. Like what? In my neighborhood? No. So I've kind of been like the world like this. So right. Would you say that New York is really, really different now, or is it just hiding in a different way? In a, it's, hiding it's a, I don't know. It's better in some ways. Crack isn't anywhere near as plentiful, and there's not as many users of that as there was the 1980s. Let me explain something to you. <laughs> in the mid-1980s, when this everything started, crack hit around 84, and... Uh, it just exploded. If if uh, the 1970s cocaine usage in the disco crowd was like a rainstorm, the 1980s was a typhoon. It was just insane. It was everywhere. It was in every part of American life. Everybody was doing it, from school teachers to cops to firemen to lawyers to judges. Everybody was involved in cocaine or crack cocaine at that time. And the crack houses, you mentioned that, uh, they started popping up around 85. And uh, in New York here, it was so bad. I mean, they, were, they popped up like, like little brush fires, right? The police would put it out. One would, one would open up a block away. Then they put that out. Another two would open two blocks away. And it just, it was this revolving door cycle that just never ended. There was no way to put it out at that point. Wow. And even here in the suburbs, it was going on in my town here in a nice part of Huntington, which is a decent town. I mean, it was everywhere. You didn't have to travel more than one or two blocks to get cocaine back then. It's just impossible to fathom for me. I grew up with D.A.R.E. 
and I grew up in Utah. And so we were quizzed about all the different kinds of drugs and what the effects were and what would happen if you took it and how to say no and all this stuff. But I was never offered anything. You know what? God bless you. And God bless me. <laughs> be thankful for that, Kate, because it's a blessing in disguise. Because let me tell you something. So many people, and I mentioned a few of them in the story. First off, I left out probably half the story. That's only a part of the story what you got. There is so much more. So many people, Generation X ha, is paying a, a huge price for what they did all these years because the cemeteries are filling up. I have lost probably 50 to 100 friends already just from around here. My daughter's mother uh, died six months after the book came out. I had mentioned at the end of the book that she uh, had robbed the bank and then she was home after like three years or whatever. She was trying to rebuild her life, but that actually wasn't the case, I found out. And she passed uh, August 22nd, 2018. And uh, it's, you know, there's been so much death and misery and stuff. And a lot of it had to do with the drugs. Yeah. When you wrote that part that you wrote about how she had been clean for the pregnancy. And then when they gave her that drug after the C-section, that just kind of woke up that monster inside. It did. I mean, the monster came back immediately. And it that was it at that point. Because you know what? She had been running, chasing it after that until she died in 2018. She ended up going to prison four or five different times and all for the same thing. I hate drugs. I, I listen, I don't like I'm not crazy about certain things like I understand they made pot legal and stuff marijuana, but that's a very slippery slope because personally for me, marijuana had a huge impact in derailing my academic career. A lot of people look at it as like it's no big deal, whatever. You, it actually is a big deal when you're younger. If you're an adult, OK, your life is on track and all that stuff. Maybe you could do it then and it won't affect you. But in your formative years, you should not be touching anything that could affect your brain and stunt its growth or, you know, detour you from what you're trying to do in life. Yeah. I'm really glad you said that. I think that's just so necessary. Like, doesn't if, even if something is legal, even if it's something is not that bad, you got to you got to be careful about your future. And yeah, the pro this is the thing I. And I've been talking about this recently. I even brought it up in some other interviews. I want to be able to go and speak to kids about all this stuff because they need to know the realities of what they're looking at down the road if they dare to start screwing around. Because it could be that first puff of marijuana in the schoolyard at 14 years old that charged your cost for the rest of your life. It can be that serious. So I, I was also curious, I wrote down all these questions after I read it. Um, how is your daughter? My daughter, uh, she, there's one problem physically that she's having. Uh, she developed epilepsy oh. around 19 years old. And, you know, it's a problem, but it's under control right now. She had a couple of brain operations a few years ago. One was brain operation. Another one was on the neck where they had to implant the device so they could you know, sent some kind of uh, stimulation to a certain part of the brain. But she is fantastic. I am so proud of her. She graduated with highest honors from the University of Pennsylvania. That's wonderful. She's going to be a lawyer. She's going to law school in uh, September. And uh, she is the best thing I have ever done in my life. I mean, by far, I am so proud of her. I love her so much. And... Mm -hmm. It's just, it's great. I can't say enough good things about her. <laughs> it's so great to hear that you have a good relationship with her. You know, she loves me. When, when she was little, for the first, like, five years of her life, before I ended up getting strung out myself, I was a really good father to her and very loving and caring and spent a lot of time with her and stuff because her mother wasn't around at that time. And uh, she never forgot that, mm -hmm. you know? And even though I disappeared at the Brooklyn for about 10 years, 
when I came back, she there was no ill will towards. I mean, she was just so happy that I was back in her life. Oh, that's so great. She it was, is. It's, it's a blessing. He was able to see that once you got out from under the hold of drugs, you were still that good person. Even when I was a drug addict, I was always good to my daughter, Samantha. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I loved her so much. I went through things in my with my family, like like with my dad and stuff. We had problems growing up. He was a little uh, heavy-handed at times and stuff, you know? And I said to myself, once I have my daughter, I'm not going to yell at her. She's not getting hit. Never. I don't want her to ever feel like I felt as a kid, you know? Mm. And I never had to. I mean, it's been wonderful. So she doesn't look at me with anything like that she's angry about, you know? So it's good. I I'm just grateful that she loves me still the way she does. Mm. That is so wonderful to hear. And now you're taking care of your dad who's got Alzheimer's. When did he, when did that start? He's got, the, he's got dementia. Uh, it happened. What, my, my father volunteered in the New York City Fire Department uh, for 31 years. And uh, he was retired. But on 9-11, when the towers came down, he, as soon as they started the cleanup, which was probably days later or whatever, my father volunteered to go down and do it. Now, Within a few years, he started noticing uh, symptoms of a certain type of skin cancer that started popping up. And then uh, further down the road, he had, he had developed another type of cancer, which they linked to the exposure to what he was down there. And so when they went to do the, uh, the radiation therapy or whatever, as soon as he was done with it, his brain was so damaged, I could not believe the difference. And now... Yeah, I'm taking care of him right now. I mean, I don't even think about it. It's not something I, I'm mad about or anything like that. I mean, it's my father. I just, I have to do it. There's no other thing but just to do it, you know? Yeah. It's been tough. I mean, the cancer's gone, but, you know, it destroyed his quality of life. Mm. Wow. So what's your life like now? Or what's your job? Is there, are you a full-time caregiver? I'm basically taking care of him full time right now. Um, I'm trying. My one big goal right now is to push this book for a series. I had one guy who's who's been in Hollywood for a long time, and he's a major writer and everything. He read my book, and he absolutely loved it. And, uh, you know, he, he thinks it's got a lot of potential to do something. So there's a few people I'm reaching out to right now to try and hopefully do something to be able to pull this off. It would make, if, if we could capture what went on back then, it would be one of the most incredible series he's ever made. If you like The Sopranos and things like that, you would absolutely love this story. It's, it would just be incredible. Yeah, it definitely sounds like a, a thing that is not real. <laughs> yeah. What did you think about, like, uh, some of the other things in the book, like the robbery crew and stuff like that? Oh, the crash and grab crew? Is that what they were called? Crash and Carry Gang, yeah. Crash and Carry Gang. Oh man, that part and of about selling all these ridiculously expensive things for a third of the price and just people, all these people going in, walking out with fur coats. It's just what? It, it's like happen? something out of a fairy tale. Like these guys used to drive trucks <laughs> through storefront windows while there were people on the street. Like like they didn't care at all. But what they did do is. They had uh, some of the guys would be very close, right, with guns and stuff. And if anybody tried to intervene, they would immediately pay the price. Even one time, some guy tried to be a hero and he went to jump out of his car and they firebombed it. Wow. Extremely dangerous people. Yeah. And the guy, <laughs> it's too gross to talk about, but the guy who pooped on, the, that you worked with that would rob people and then poop on their cars or whatever, like, what? That guy, Big Ray, was the biggest maniac I had ever met in my entire life. I mean, he's a great guy, funny guy. I mean, I still talk to him to this day. We have a great friendship, and uh, but he was one character, boy. He is unbelievable guy. He's bizarre. He's out there, you know, yeah. but uh, I don't care about any of that stuff. You know, it doesn't bother me. But one thing that is just really frightening and 
I've been aware of it to some degree through the, the news coming out, you know, about all these, the, the people of color getting killed and people finally like recording it and, and talking about just how much depravity there is within corners of the police department. Well, I, I'm, I'm like, a lot of people have opinions on this and stuff. I'm actually one of them who's actually lived it. Yeah. I was living in East, East New York in Brooklyn, okay? And the problems with when blacks come into white neighborhoods, okay? The white people that go into those neighborhoods have the same problem, okay? So the police, I mean, they laid the wood to me one day for no reason whatsoever. And, uh, you know, they cracked my head open, my skull. They, they broke one of my ribs. I was, my eyes were black. I mean, I had bruises up and down my body. The one guy beat me over the head with a radio about 20 times. How are you and, alive? Uh, nobody was recording it at the time. This was just before all the recording stuff started happening. If they would have got that on video, that would have been woof. Because it was, it was really scary stuff. Unless you're under that, unless you've been in that type of situation, you have actually no idea how frightening that is. When I look at George Floyd, I know exactly what he was thinking and what he felt like when that was starting to happen. Because there's no, you know, I could see if, if, if there's a problem, like some, some guy's a, a done, done toting maniac that's shooting at the cops or something, and something happens. But they killed that guy for no reason. I mean, they just, and, and you better believe this. It could happen to you. It could happen to me. It could happen to anybody out there. So you got to be vigilant and, and be careful about things. And it, it's really a scary topic. I'm really glad to live in Sweden. I mean, maybe that sounds a little bit cold to everybody who's stuck living in places that it's not safe, but I'm okay. I'll, I'll say I'm glad that my kids are living in Sweden. It's not just about me. Hey, you know what, Kate? It's a blessing because New York City, first off, New York City was a lot more dangerous years ago than it is now, but things still happen now, even to this day. So it, it back then, Things were happening like George Floyd and stuff. What happened to me? I mean, that was an everyday thing. You know, that was not some isolated incident. It was, it was, New York was so crazy for years, for decades and decades. People would never believe what it was like, you know, during like the 60s, 70s, 80s and 90s, how bad it was. I would love if you have a chance to talk about how we need to destigmatize the methadone project that that it needs to be available for people that need to, that that want to get out of it out of out of addiction. Kate, I'm really glad you brought this up because I am living today because of that methadone program. It is not I understand maybe some there might be a few people that go there cuz they're looking at whatever, but let me tell you something. That place saves lives. It's mm -hmm. saved my life. It it is it is it is definitely responsible for saving my life. I could, if I had to go cold turkey or detox and then just be put right back on the street, I, I would have died. You know, I was very close to death by the time I finally got on the program. It, it is very essential for, for someone who's using heroin or other opiates or whatever it may be to be able to stop being sick from the drug itself, the constant withdrawal and all that stuff, because that stuff pushes you with the crime and things like that so once they can finally stop being sick on a on a 24 12 hour basis whatever it is all the time you stabilize them first with the methadone and then slowly they'll start to stabilize their life a little bit it's really the only chance somebody who's on heroin or whatever the opiate may be to be able to have a chance at a life again mm -hmm. very few people are able to just cold turkey it Walk away and never touch it ever again. It's almost impossible. I'm just, I want to, I want people to have compassion and to, to, I want people to read your book and have compassion for that kind of suffering and to, to, to be fired up to support the things and places in their community that are, there, there are people are, that are deciding, should we go for this program? Yes. For the love of mud and everything, just go for it. 
I think I almost, I think I mentioned it, if I'm not mistaken, in the book, where I said, uh, you know, it gets a bad rap, but uh, it really works if you work it. If you work the program with it, it, it will work, and you, your life can be saved. Your life can be turned around. I was broke, penniless, and on death's door when I went on that program, and slowly but surely, I was able to start getting my life back together. And, you know, I was able to, you know, come back to Huntington, cleaned up, and I wrote a book and, you know, hopefully some big things are going to happen in the future, which I think they are. And I would have never been able to do that had it not been for the methadone program, give me an opportunity to get off the other stuff. I'm so glad. I'm so glad that you're alive and that you had wonderful people in your life and that you have this hope to, to make the world a better place. I try and tell people like, I get depressed though from time to time. I really do because I've been dealt a, a bad hand quite a few times in the last year. I mean, I've lost probably a dozen friends in the last year. My mother, my cousin, it's been really, really, really hard. But I have other friends that are down and out right now. And I talk to them and I say, look, you got to promise me one thing. Don't ever give up. I don't care how bad things get. Don't ever give up on yourself because one day, your life could completely change. You may not believe it right now when you're at that level, but I'm telling you it's true. It can happen. Just don't ever give up on yourself. And anybody out there, I'm saying the same thing. Never quit on yourself. Be, be good to yourself and give yourself a chance, even if you're struggling, because one day things may turn around and you have to give yourself that chance. Well, I think... That's a pretty wonderful place to leave it off. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I like it too. Thank Kate. Okay, thank you so much for having me. Thank I mean, I might have got a little carried away with some stuff, but you know, I get it, it gets me uh, worked up some of these topics, you know. Yeah. I love it when people talk about what they're passionate about. It's 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 real, it's from the heart. You know, that's why I said in the beginning, I'm like, I need to get out to these schools. This has got to be nipped in the bud. The problem is, is in this country, we wait until it's already, you know, the barn door's already open and the horse is gone. What we need to do is we need to think almost like a chess player, get four and five and six moves ahead of that next generation and find a way to try and stop this, the momentum, because every generation, you can almost see it coming. You have to find a way to slow it down and try and reverse that trend. Definitely. Oh. I believe if you if you if people think about it enough, if the government took people like me and some of the smartest people in the world and put together a think tank and sat and really discussed this stuff from everybody's perspective, people that have been out there, people that know what it's like, things that might help, what might not help, there's ways that you could put something really big together to try and help stop some of this. Yes. Oh, I want to see that happen, too. You know, I, I wrote something to a couple of uh, entertainers back when right after the George Floyd thing started happening. I had said to them about the uh, police stuff. I said, look, I said, I'm white. OK, I lived in those areas. I know what it's like to go through that stuff. I said, I could tell you a lot about it. Let's put together a, a round table from get a few cops there, get a couple of uh, uh, politicians there get a few people that have been under the gun with the police like I was, and let's sit down and talk about this stuff and come together and try and find a way to stop these things from happening. And you know what? I got nothing but silence. None of them reached back to me. None of them reached out to me. You know, I'm not saying I'm anybody special. I'm not. But I had a really good idea that I think could have done something about making some progress. Yeah. Well, you know what? If you have any people in your sphere of influence about this, um, put, 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 blah, blah, blah. put them in my path and I can have a conversation with them and we can at least get some conversation going, even if it's not as big as you would like, we can get something going. That's a fantastic idea. Yeah. We'll, be, we'll speak again in the future. This isn't the last time you'll hear from me, Kate. <laughs> oh, good. I'm glad. Oh, thank you so much for taking the time to talk. And I, I would definitely want to remind everybody there's going to be links in the description to get this book. 
and I read it on my Kindle, and it was a very fast read for me. <laughs> It'll keep you it's going. Not, listen, I was a first-time author. I hadn't written anything since ninth grade. I mean, I don't even have a high school diploma. So it wasn't easy for me. If, if I had somebody kind of, uh, you know, schooling me while I was doing this, I would have put a lot more stuff in because I forgot I really should have went stressed of how bad the family suffered with the people who are caught up in this whole story. Mm. And, well, you, you know, know but, you wrote one book, you can write another one. Yeah, well, I believe if we can do the series, we could have an epic series that could get all this stuff out mm. and teach people a lot about real life. Yeah, I love it. So the way that I um, end my conversations is I give hugs. <laughs> well, I'll try and hug you back. <laughs> Thank you, Kate. Thank you. It's been, it's been a pleasure to be on your show. I, I really enjoyed myself. This has been really meaningful. Really, I just kind of feel like I could just go lay down and cry for a little bit. Just I, feel, I have so many feelings to just kind of woke up and, and talking to you and just hearing about how big this need in this world is. It's, it's huge. It's sad because you know what? Uh, I lost a friend last week for this stuff and it did not have to happen. All these people I went to school with are dead. And like, I look around, it is so sad. And like, nobody cares. That's the big tragedy in it. Not enough people care. People are dying. I think if you save one life, that's a huge thing because every life is sacred. Everybody is important on this planet. We're all God's children and we all should live a long life and a happy one. Yeah, definitely. You have a big heart. Thank you. I didn't so much when I was younger, but you know what? Life itself can change you as a person. Don't, don't listen to anyone who says, oh, people don't change. That is not true. I am looking at you. I am a person who's been changed and humbled and just completely different now. I wouldn't know it was the same guy after reading the kind of person you were and talking to you now. I would not know. I would not recognize that you were the same person. Yeah, you know what? Sometimes it takes life's experiences to humble somebody and make them realize what's really important in life. I'm at an age now where like everything is important. I mean, every, everything, you know, I just, I don't want to argue with anyone anymore. I don't want to bad mouth anybody anymore. I try and keep things positive. I like to lift people up now. That's great. <laughs> I'm trying, <laughs> yeah. but uh, you know, hopefully we have to get these things done in the future and uh, make a profound impact on the world at one point. Yes. And I'd love to have you back on my channel and hear about how, and, and I'll be excited to follow the social medias to see how, how these things develop, the, the dreams that you have. They're going to happen. I mean, my mother said to me on her deathbed, Michael, you do not stop until you accomplish what you set out to do. You promised me. And I made a promise to her. And she died like a day later. I can't let her down. I refuse to let my mother down. So we'll get it done. Give us a little bit more time. Yeah, for sure. I'll give you hugs again. Thank you, Kate. Thank you so much. You're a sweet lady. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye, Kate. Have a great weekend, all right?